In June 2011, a night that started out as any other normal night would end in one of the most frustrating true crime cases in recent years, which has left the victim's family as well as people all over the country wondering what happened. This case is a bit more complex because of all of the different places and different people that are involved, but I'm going to explain it all to you as best as I can and as simply as possible. Hey guys, my name is Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life. Let's jump in right now. Twenty-year-old Lauren Spear was born on January 17, 1991. As a child, she was said to have been very high energy. She cared for everyone around her and was always very outspoken and independent. Her parents, Charlene and Robert, just adored her. Her favorite type of music was anything from the 60s and 70s, kind of an old school, and just a really amazing girl. She grew up in Scarsdale, New York, and graduated from Edgemont High School in 2009. During her teenage years, she discovered that she was a very fast runner, and while she had loved playing soccer growing up, she quickly discovered that she now had a passion for lacrosse. This discovery made her put soccer on the back burner, with lacrosse being high on her priority list. In fact, Lauren was so talented that before the season even started, she was asked to be on the varsity team as a freshman. That's how talented she was. But sadly, her lacrosse journey was quickly halted when she was diagnosed with long QT syndrome, which is a heart condition that causes very fast and chaotic heartbeats. Now, because of this, she couldn't continue to play sports, so she unfortunately had to withdraw from the team and pursue new interests. But Lauren didn't let that stop her, and she quickly became interested in fashion, more specifically, vintage styles of fashion, kind of like her music taste. She took her love of fashion very seriously and always put forth her best effort in every outfit she had, and she even won Best Dressed during her senior year of high school. During her senior year was also when she took fashion from being just an interest and a hobby to a full-blown future career. Every single Saturday, she hopped on a train in New York City and attended a class for teenagers who were interested in careers in fashion. This class was held at the Fashion Institute of Technology. To say she was dedicated would have been a massive understatement. After graduating high school, she decided to enroll at Indiana University, where she was majoring in merchandising textiles. Lauren was also very devoted to her Jewish faith, and the fact that Indiana University had an amazing community of other Jewish students was also a huge reason why she ended up picking that school. During one of their spring breaks, Lauren and some other schoolmates took a trip to Israel to plant trees on behalf of the National Jewish Fund. I mean, Pretty amazing at such a young age. Talk about an incredible trip and incredible life experience. In addition to the large Jewish community, she also became a part of a well-known fashion program as well. There was another huge benefit, too, to attending Indiana University for Lauren. Her boyfriend, Jesse Wolf, was already a student there. Growing up, Lauren would attend summer camps at this place called Camp Tawanda. The summer camp was in a mountain town in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, and she had been attending since she was just 10 years old. She ended up meeting Jesse about three years prior to her attending Indiana University, and the two had a summer camp romance that then turned into something more consistent and something more serious. Jesse was a couple of years older, but the two of them were madly in love. Friends of Lauren said that she didn't specifically choose Indiana University because Jesse went there, but that it certainly helped to grow their relationship. They had been dating for three years at that point, and everyone around them said that they were still in that young puppy love phase of their relationship, the honeymoon stage. Now, Lauren had also met a man named Jay Rosenbaum at that same year that she had met Jesse at that camp. The two of them never really clicked as a possible couple or even considered it as an option. Jay was the same age as Lauren, and although they never hit it off romantically, they definitely did hit it off as friends. And Jay also was attending the university and often hung out with Lauren and Jesse. Indiana University was voted the number one party school in America in 2002, which is a reputation that is still held in 2023. And Lauren and Jesse had their fair share of helping those statistics out. And none of this is said with any judgment. I think we can all agree that the majority of college students, no matter their university, 
are there and partying at some point. So during this time at the university, it was pretty common for students to take things like Xanax or cocaine to pregame and heighten their intoxication when it came time to actually go to the party. But Lauren's doctor had warned her that she should not take any of these things or have excessive amounts of alcohol due to her heart condition. However, that didn't completely stop her. In September of 2010, Lauren and Jesse were arrested at a tailgate party for public intoxication and also for illegal consumption. Police described it as, and I quote, a simple alcohol arrest in the tailgate fields during a home football game. So the two of them were booked into the Monroe County Jail and then quickly released once they both had sobered up a bit. The charges were ultimately dropped, and they both had to pay a fine of about a little over $400, as well as participate in a program for responsible alcohol use. During Lauren's sophomore year, she was living off campus in the Smallwood Plaza apartments. She finished her classes for the year in the spring and was waiting on Jesse to finish his summer classes. They had planned that once his summer classes were over, they would travel back home to the East Coast together, and Lauren had even scored an internship at a local clothing store in her hometown. So the future was looking very bright for Lauren, and she was so excited for all that was to come. Now, the timeline that we're about to go over can be a little bit confusing because of all of the places they go and all of the different people who are involved at times, and then not at other times. So I'm going to try to do my best to explain them in the least confusing way possible. On the night of June 2nd, 2011, Lauren had been hanging out with some friends at a neighboring apartment. They were casually drinking some wine and watching a basketball game. Lauren had been texting Jesse, who was also watching the game from his off-campus house. Lauren had told Jesse that she had a migraine and was probably going to stay in for the rest of the night. So Jesse told her, well, if you wake up, call me and we'll talk, and then went to bed after the game. Sometime after Jesse had fallen asleep, their friend Jay had invited Lauren and her friends to go pregame with him and his friend Corey Rossman. Lauren had met Corey the weekend before at a racing event, so she knew of him, but wasn't exactly close friends with him yet. Lauren and her neighbor, David Ron, walked over to Corey's, which was not a far walk from their Smallwood Plaza apartments. Surveillance video showed Lauren leaving her apartment with a white shirt and black pants or black leggings on. And that was the start of what would become at the very beginning of a very heavy night of drinking for the entire crew. Lauren's neighbor and friend David decided to leave Corey's apartment at 12.30 a.m., and he was seen on surveillance footage returning back to his apartment in the Smallwood Plaza and not leaving again until the late morning hours. After about an hour of pre-gaming, Lauren and Corey left together and went to Kilroy's Sports Bar, which was walking distance from where they were and was a very popular spot for students. Lauren used her fake ID to get into the bar, and she was also seen on surveillance cameras taking off her shoes to stand in the sand patio that was at the bar. After about 40 minutes of being at Kilroy's, Lauren and Corey were seen leaving Kilroy's and heading back to Lauren's apartment in the Smallwood Plaza, where they arrived at 2.30 a.m. Now, at that point, Lauren had been drinking a lot since she was watching the game hours before, then again at the pregame, then at the bar, so needless to say, she had consumed a lot of alcohol. Lauren was a very small girl, too, who weighed under 100 pounds, so at that point, she was drunk enough that she had left her cell phone and her shoes behind at the bar. Other people at the bar noticed that she was so visibly intoxicated that Corey actually had to help her walk and stand at multiple times. Once Corey and Lauren got back to the complex, they took the elevator to the fifth floor, where Lauren's apartment was, but they were confronted by four men one of them being her boyfriend, Jesse's fraternity brother, Zach Oates. The four of them were concerned about how drunk Lauren was and the fact that she was with this man who she had just met and barely even knew. And just making my own assumptions here, but if they saw Lauren so drunk that she was barefoot and couldn't even walk, they probably felt like Corey might be trying to take advantage of her. Rightfully so, I think. That's where anybody's mind would go. So they all began arguing, and then one of the men punched Corey in the face, sending him straight to the ground. Corey and Lauren were the ones to leave the situation, despite being just feet away from her apartment, and they decided that they would go back to Corey's place at five North Townhomes. Surveillance cameras again caught them walking down an alley where Lauren was visibly stumbling and ended up falling two separate times. She dropped her keys as well as her purse, but kept on walking without them. Once again, you can tell by this description just how drunk she really was. 
Once they got back to Corey's apartment, Corey's roommate Mike Beth, who was completely sober at the time and had stayed home that night to get some work done, immediately began taking in the scene of the two of them. Apparently, Lauren wasn't the only one that was extremely intoxicated. Mike claimed that Corey had been so drunk as well that he was stumbling around the room and also was throwing up on the carpet. Mike helped to clean up Corey and then put him to bed, then called Jay to come take care of Lauren, who had lived right next door to Corey and Mike at Five North Townhomes. Like we mentioned earlier, Corey and Lauren had just met, so chances are Mike probably barely even knew Lauren as well, and probably thought she was just some drunk girl that he didn't want to be responsible for. Lauren then ended up at Jay's house, where he had already been sobering up from the pregame earlier. Jay was really trying to get Lauren to stop drinking and to just sleep on his couch overnight instead of walking home. But Jay said that whenever he tried to get Lauren to sit down and just chill out, she was insistent that they keep on drinking, even though at that point, it was now 4.15 in the morning. Jay was over it and not at all in the mood to keep the party going whatsoever. So he backed off and kind of just let her sit by herself, hoping that she would start to sober up or maybe even just fall asleep for the night. But his plan didn't work at all because just 15 minutes later, Lauren was up and saying that she was going to walk home and wasn't letting anyone tell her otherwise. Like I mentioned earlier, Lauren's complex was fairly close to the townhomes where Jay lived. It was just a three block walk in between, so maybe 15 to 20 minutes at the absolute most, giving her even a little extra time since she was clearly wasted. Lauren walked out of Jay's apartment, still barefoot and without her phone, since she had left both of them at the bar and was still very drunk. She walked down 11th Street and then turned right at the intersection of College Avenue. The next morning, Jesse began calling Lauren's phone like he normally would, but to his surprise, a random person had answered it. The person on the other end of the line was a worker at Kilroy's bar, and they told Jesse that the phone was left the night before and they weren't sure who it belonged to. Now, Jesse was extremely confused by all of this because, as I mentioned earlier, he had gone to sleep after the game, believing that Lauren had a migraine and was also going to be doing the same thing, not going out, certainly not partying. He expected that when he called her the next morning, he might hear that her migraine had or had not gone away or maybe how she slept it off, but definitely not that she had gone out the night before. He immediately got a hold of Lauren's roommates to see if she was home, but her bed was empty and it hadn't looked like it had even been slept in at all the night before. So all of Lauren's friends began trying to piece together where she might have been, hoping that maybe she had just crashed at someone's place and didn't have a way to let anyone know where she was since she had lost her phone. But the answer from everyone that they called was always the same. Lauren wasn't with them and they had no idea where she was. After searching for Lauren the better half of the day, Jesse filed a missing persons report at 4.30 p.m., almost 12 hours after Lauren had last been seen out by other witnesses and those surveillance cameras. Jesse also contacted her family, and just one day later, Rob, Charlene, and Lauren's older sister, Rebecca, were in Bloomington searching for Lauren. Rob and Charlene were just sitting down for dinner when they got the horrible news about Lauren. Lauren's older sister, Rebecca, had called them and let them know that none of Lauren's friends had seen her since the night before, and something like this had never happened before, and it was extremely unlike Lauren. So they knew in their gut right away that something was just not right. Within a day, Lauren's story was making national headlines. Celebrities like Kim Kardashian even began tweeting about Lauren. Her family and friends began putting searches together of the entire local area, but still, Lauren was nowhere. Investigators were amazed at how someone who was quite literally seen on surveillance footage from place to place that she had gone to that night now somehow had missed any cameras on the walk home. Immediately after the news of Lauren's disappearance broke, a rumor began circulating around town that a homeless man had heard the sound of a woman's scream just west of where Lauren had last been seen. A reporter from Bloomington Herald Times looked into this rumor that was spreading like wildfire at the time, but could not find if this was a tip that had been looked into or if the man that had claimed he had heard that scream had also been looked into. Many of the locals believed it was a man named Franklin Crawford, who the students all nicknamed Road Dog, and they thought this could have been who was supposedly hearing all of this, hearing the scream. But interestingly enough, Franklin died just days after Lauren's disappearance and days after this rumor began circulating. In the early days after Lauren first went missing, the entire community came together to help the Spear family in any way that they could. 
Several local businesses raised money for a reward fund and also printed out missing person signs with Lauren's face all over them, and they shared them everywhere in Bloomington. The Jewish community also organized many events and fundraisers for Lauren. In total, a $120,000 reward was able to be put out to anyone who might have information regarding Lauren's case. Police immediately began putting together a timeline of where Lauren was, as well as who she was with. Jay was the first person that investigators approached, considering that he was supposedly the last person to have seen her. He told investigators that he first saw Lauren when she showed up to the pregame with a friend, who was David, and then that that friend had told him that they snorted Klonopin, mixed with cocaine, before they had come over. Jay told them that he saw Lauren again after she had gotten back from Kilroy's with Corey, and that she had used his phone to try and call David. Now my guess is maybe that was to get someone to keep partying with her since Jay wouldn't. Jay told them that he walked her to his door and then watched her leave. Investigators again looked into security camera footage along the sidewalk and the road where Jay said that she was walking home, but none of them picked her up anywhere. She was seen earlier in the night so drunk that Corey at one point had her over his shoulder in a fireman's carry, so it confirmed that she had likely been very drunk all night long, including when she left Jay's house. Now, you know how drunk people can be, so who's to say that she even took that route home or didn't head somewhere else in between? Lauren's boyfriend Jesse was also very present and participated in the initial search efforts for Lauren until his parents came into Bloomington and then made him stop. Now this built a very large bridge between the Spearer and Wolf family. On the night that Lauren went missing, witnesses claim he was sleeping in his apartment that night, which he also claimed. However, police have been unable to prove or disprove his alibi. Lauren's parents were very open in the media that they thought that Jesse, Corey, Jay, and Mike hadn't been cooperative. Jesse's parents, however, refuted that and even made many disparaging comments about Lauren over the years to come. The Wolfs claimed that Jesse talked to Lauren's parents without lawyers present, talked to their private investigators, and even allegedly took a polygraph test just two weeks after Lauren had disappeared. And they said that that test was apparently administered by a retired FBI polygrapher with irrefutable credentials, therefore making it a complete load of crap that Jesse wasn't cooperative. The Wolfs even claimed to the public that Lauren had a horrible drug problem. Jesse's mother, Nadine, had told reporters, and I quote, If Jesse was guilty of anything, he was guilty of taking care of Lauren, who had some serious drug issues. She would abuse to the point where she would always black out. Jesse always threatened to call and tell her parents, and she said, If you do, I'll break up with you. My son took care of her for two years while she was in college. The one night she went out without him and did what she did, unfortunately, may have cost her her life. She claimed that the Spears were liars and that Jesse had been completely cooperative. Now, I know Jesse's parents were worried about their son being slandered in the media, but her whole statement seemed very victim blamey to me. The things that Nadine said were pretty harsh. I mean, we do know that the university was a party school, and clearly Lauren and Jesse both had their fair share of drunken nights. We also know that David had allegedly claimed that he and Lauren had snorted Klonopin mixed with cocaine that night. Well, after she disappeared, police did a search of her room, and they did find a small amount of cocaine, which in theory would align with what David had allegedly said they had taken that night. Witnesses at the pregame even claimed to have seen and heard Lauren talking about using drugs. Charlene and Rob were quick to point out that there was no proof that she had taken any sort of drugs that night, and they also denied the fact that she was a drug addict, although they admitted that it was clear she had gotten a little bit carried away with the party culture while at university. I think either way that it truly doesn't matter or make her more or less deserving of help, but I also think that Nadine making all of those disparaging claims was a perhaps a little bit selfish, just for the mere fact that her case was gaining so much traction. But we know how little empathy people give others, especially when drugs begin to get involved. And I would hate to think that people began to care less or not feel as much empathy for the situation just because of something she may or may not have been doing. There has been a good amount of speculation in this case and rumors regarding Jesse and Lauren's relationship, which could also be the reason why Nadine cut off all ties with the Spear family and Jesse's involvement in the search. As soon as news hit that Lauren had gone missing and the timeline started to come together on her whereabouts that night, a lot of people were confused on why Lauren hadn't called or texted Jesse that she was planning on going out. 
Of course, the entire thing could have very easily just been that Lauren had truly thought that she was going to stay in, but Jay texted her and made her change her mind. Or maybe Lauren didn't call or text Jesse to come out because she didn't want him to be there. Who knows? Just like the drug situation, either thing does not matter, and nobody is judging her either way. But it is important to note these possible dynamics with everyone involved. As we know, Corey and Jesse's friend ended up getting into a physical fight that night. So, is there a possibility that Jesse's friend had called him and let him know that Lauren was out with another man, another man that they barely knew, and this caused him to possibly do something to Lauren? Now, I'm not saying that this is what happened with 100% certainty, and we are going to get into all of that in just a second, and we will also get more into all of the other men involved that night. But I do think that it's important to just raise the concern and note it. Especially since Jesse's alibi has never really been confirmed or denied. So people on Reddit began combing through Jesse and Lauren's Facebook, and you can imagine how deep of a dive they were doing. And they noted that allegedly earlier in the year, they had actually unfriended each other for a short period of time. So could this have been because of a breakup that they had? Was their relationship a bit rocky to begin with? Investigators looked into Corey since he had spent a good chunk of the night with Lauren. He had told investigators that due to being punched by Jesse's frat brother and being drunk, he didn't remember the rest of the night. He later came out on USA Today and claimed that his lawyer had made that statement, not him. He told the media, I was not the last person with her, and that's all I can say. I'm sorry. I just hope that they find her as soon as possible, and I am praying for her and her family. Like we mentioned earlier, Jay had been the last person to see Lauren. He gave authorities two full statements on what he saw that night and where Lauren was the last time that he had seen her. So a few months after Lauren disappeared, he also provided law enforcement with a past polygraph test. Many people have had issues with the fact that Jay, Corey, and Jesse had all lawyered up, though, right after she disappeared, having a problem with that if they are truly innocent. Now, I know that lawyering up can be a very controversial topic, but given the immense media coverage on this story, as well as the rumors that began spreading around town and the media, I think it makes sense that they did that regardless of their guilt or their innocence. Jay did tell authorities that when he saw Lauren later that night after she had been with Corey, she had what looked to be a small bruise under her eye. He claimed that when he asked Lauren what it was from, she said she didn't remember. If this is true, it more than likely would have been from her multiple falls that night. But could it have been more than just that? By June 7th, Lauren's story had hit Good Morning America and CBS Morning News. A Facebook page called Help Lauren Spear had hit 12,000 followers, and another Facebook page related to events for Lauren had hit 72,000 followers, which was around the same population of the town of Bloomington itself at the time. On June 8th, investigators received an anonymous tip to search Lake Monroe, which is about a 25-minute drive south of the university. A dive team used boats and sonar equipment to search for any possible trace of Lauren, but they found nothing. A team of over 100 volunteers even searched the nearby 100-acre Griffey Reservoir for any possible clues or signs of Lauren, but that too came up completely empty. Uh, to address a couple of things that you're probably wondering about, the dive team search, uh, as I said yesterday, that was based on a tip we got that had a specific location that we should search. The dive team uh, did not get finished yesterday, so they did go back out and, uh, and finish that up. So, uh, or, no, uh, they finished uh, yesterday, yes. Thank you. Uh, so we just, uh, again, they, uh, they didn't get it covered in one afternoon, so they just went back out and finished that up, but uh, negative result. By June 10th, police did not have any suspects in the case, though they did have at least 10 persons of interest, including Jesse, Corey, Jay, and Mike. Bloomington Police Lieutenant Bill Parker said that Jesse had been cooperative and they had been speaking with him regularly. He also added that Corey Rossman had been more than willing to give a sample of his DNA. Rumors had begun circulating, basically as soon as Lauren went missing, especially since it had gotten so much media coverage. The main rumor was that Lauren had accidentally overdosed due to drug consumption mixed with her heart problem, and that her friends from that night had panicked and then chose to dispose of her body. Police ended up having a press conference on June 13th just to discuss the rumor and make it known that they were aware of everything being said and that there were no suspects in the case so far. 
Investigators were still searching day in and day out for Lauren. They combed through surveillance footage over and over with fresh eyes to look for anything that could possibly be suspicious or out of the ordinary. On June 15th, another press conference was held. At this press conference, Bloomington police released grainy footage of a white pickup truck that possibly was connected to Lauren's case. The truck had passed by cameras twice in the area at the time that Lauren had last been seen, and although the footage is very grainy, it almost looks as if someone or something is in the back of the truck. Uh, since we released that picture, uh, I'm told that we have received uh, nearly 300 tips that have come in uh, since uh, approximately noon yesterday, and the vast majority of those tips are related to information regarding a white truck. Uh, at this time, the investigators continue to track down that information in hopes that it might lead to uh, a lead in itself and or information that it will point us in a direction uh, that will give us some uh, valuable information for this ongoing investigation. Even though this brought in many tips and a lot of people got their hopes up that this would be substantial for the case, just five days later, the police announced that the truck was no longer considered part of this investigation. The news came just one day after the Indiana State Police had been sent on a search of the woods southwest of Martinsville after being called there about an unusual odor. Unfortunately, this tip, just like everything else that had came in, ended up being empty. Lauren's family understandably began to start losing hope very quickly. Up until then, there had been daily searches for Lauren. Bloomington Police Captain Joe Qualters announced that there would be no more press conferences unless there was a break in the case. Not even a full month after Lauren went missing, and the daily searches were stopped after less than 20 people a day began to show up. And by that point, they had covered almost all of the county. So I cannot imagine the desperation that her family felt to see everyone in the community and online that seemed to care so much just weeks earlier suddenly give up. I think everyone felt that at that point they were just searching for a body and it was no longer a rescue mission, but a recovery. Are you satisfied with the progress that's being made? Is there something that's, that could be done that isn't being done? Well, to answer the first part of your question, uh, we're not satisfied with the results because we haven't found Lauren, obviously. Uh, but we believe that the Bloomington police and the other uh, state resources and some federal resources that are being allocated to this case uh, are being done in a meaningful and organized way, and I think that they're doing everything that they can do. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have any closure. Uh, we haven't been able to find Lauren, but I know that they're working on it, and we feel that they're doing everything they can. On July 3rd, one month after Lauren went missing, a body was found. Everyone was holding their breaths, just waiting for the news of if it was Lauren or not. Two days later, police revealed that based on the physical structural characteristics of the body, the facial structure, dental structure, and hair on the head— that the body was not Lauren's. I know her family probably didn't want this to be her, but at the same time, I can't imagine not having that sense of closure. So another month passes, and on August 16th, Bloomington police began searching the Sycamore Ridge landfill, this after receiving an anonymous tip. The landfill is about 55 miles away from the university, but it also accepts trash from the Bloomington area. A team from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children aided in the search. The search lasted nine long days, and they sorted through an estimated 4,000 tons of trash. But still, they did not find anything related to Lauren's disappearance or Lauren herself. Within the next year, this would become a very common occurrence. On March 10, 2012, remains were again found in Newton, Illinois. They were determined not to be Lauren. On July 8, 2012, a human skull was found in the White River in Indianapolis. It was determined to not have belonged to Lauren. On September 6, 2012, a body was found in an apartment complex in Indiana, but it again was determined not to be Lauren. Over and over again, her family had to hear the news that Lauren possibly had been found, just to get told that she hadn't and that she was still out there somewhere. In August of 2012, a 56-year-old man was taken into the hospital for a mental evaluation after officers found him near the bar that Lauren had gone missing at. But he wasn't by himself. 
He was there with two loaded semi-automatic handguns and a loaded shotgun in the back of his car, just watching all of the college students. And oddly enough, he began making a lot of weird comments about Lauren and her case. Police say that the man said that he had been watching the Kilroy's bar from a parking garage on the night that Lauren disappeared, similar to what he had been doing when they picked him up. He apparently made other bizarre comments about Lauren's disappearance, and he even claimed that he had met her once at a shooting range. When police searched his house, they found 48 more automatic weapons. They held him for 24 hours and gave him a psych eval, as the law states to do, but then they released him after the 24 hours was up. They determined that the man had nothing to do with Lauren's case or disappearance, and was more than likely some kind of odd fan of the case, fanatic at that point. In June of 2013, Lauren's parents filed a lawsuit against Corey, Jay, and Mike. The lawsuit was for negligence resulting in the disappearance, death, or injury of an adult. Two months after this lawsuit was filed, their lawyers asked a judge to dismiss it, claiming that they had been cooperative with police and were not liable for what happened to Lauren that night. The judge ended up dismissing the case, stating that Charlene and Rob failed to prove that any of them had a duty to care for Lauren that night, and as a result, were liable for her disappearance. In regards to Corey, the judge said that since he seemed to be just as intoxicated as Lauren was, he especially was in no position to be caring for anyone. Corey spoke to the media after this lawsuit, saying that the Spears were harassing him as well as the other men. He told the Journal News, It's inappropriate the way that they're harassing people that are also victims in this case. We've done nothing wrong. If we'd done something wrong, we would have been arrested already. All they're doing is hurting my career. So years started to go by, and investigators were still no closer to finding Lauren than they were the day that she went missing in 2011. Everyone got older and continued their lives. Everyone graduated, began their adult jobs, and moved on. But Lauren's family did not. Charlene, Robert, and Lauren's sister Rebecca never stopped looking for Lauren, but they had told the media that they knew at that point. They understood that realistically, they were not expecting to find Lauren alive but that they still deserved closure. I really just would like to be able to bring Lauren home. In 2016, almost five years after Lauren had disappeared, Lauren's family was filled with hope again that they might finally get the answers they were looking for when the FBI searched two properties that they claimed were in connection to Lauren's case. One was in Martinsville, and the other was in Trafalgar. They were searching for 35-year-old Justin Waggers, who at that point was completely unknown to the public. He wasn't a friend of Lauren's or anyone in her social circle. At the time they searched the properties, Justin was already in jail on charges from 2012 for violating a protective order and telling a woman that she should say goodbye to all of her friends and family. He is also on the registry and had been charged with doing horrific conduct in front of a minor. Justin made 44 calls to the woman who had the protective order against him and told her in one of the calls, let me tell you something, I could slip into your house and do you in and no one would even know I was there. So clearly, this guy has a tendency for threatening and for violence, right? So the search of the property took between four to six hours. The FBI told reporters that the details of the search warrant for the home would remain sealed unless criminal charges were filed. But to this day, nothing has been filed. So there's a chance that we may never know what led the FBI to Justin's family home or if they found anything relevant to Lauren's case. For now, we know that investigators did not find a body, but did they find evidence of what happened to the missing IU students? RTV6's Jack Reinhardt went to Bloomington in search for answers. Bloomington police have received more than 2,500 tips since Lauren Spear disappeared nearly four and a half years ago. But Bloomington police won't say what the tip was that led them to the home of Justin Wagers. Today, Bloomington police would only confirm they received assistance from the FBI and that the search for Lauren Spear remains active and ongoing. Justin's ex-wife of 10 years, Gail Green, spoke to the media about the search. She claimed that they were together during the time of Lauren's disappearance and that she believed that he had no involvement in her case whatsoever. Gail said, and I quote, If I thought for one moment that he was capable of or linked to a young girl's disappearance, I have a young daughter. I most certainly would have turned him in myself. 
She even claimed that she believed Justin's ex-girlfriend put in an anonymous tip to the FBI just to be petty and hold a grudge against Justin. Justin's father and grandfather have also stated that they don't believe he had anything to do with Lauren's case. Well, I don't think that's in him. I don't think that he had anything to do with nothing like that. <laughs> I don't. I just don't believe he did. I, they uh, it just don't uh, just don't don't fit him. I mean, he was just too good a boy to. One thing that is very common throughout this case is that the FBI and Bloomington police have kept things very, very private. That is also why no one has any security camera footage from the night that Lauren disappeared, and all the public has is the one grainy photo and the truck photo that turned out to be essentially useless. I would assume and hope that they are telling Rob and Charlene more than the public so they aren't confused and let down each time things like this get brought up. Could they be keeping things more private because they feel like they have something substantial that would do too much damage if the public saw it? Possibly. There are tons of theories in this case, too, so I'm going to briefly go over a couple of them because at this point, 12 years later, any one of them could be possible. The first theory is, of course, the main theory and the rumor that has been spread from the jump. It was someone close in Lauren's social circle. Maybe she truly overdosed, and instead of calling 911, they panicked and then hit her body. Now, my only issue with this is that I find it hard to believe that a couple of 20-year-olds, some of whom weren't even sober, could manage to hide a body so well that it wouldn't be found for 12 years. Not even just hiding the body, but managing to escape every single security camera in the area. Police combed through footage what seemed like an endless amount of times, checking each vehicle and finding the person it belonged to. Now, I'm not saying that if I had a friend that was as drunk as she was, I would necessarily let her walk home by herself, but my own personal morals aside, it seems like the only thing they did wrong was just be straight up rude by not making sure that she made it home safely. The next theory involves that white pickup truck. Is it possible that someone was driving down the road with no ill intentions initially, but then saw Lauren in the state that she was in and decided to act on the opportunity? A man named James McClish had recently been released from prison just before Lauren went missing, and he drove a similar white truck. He was living in a halfway house just 10 minutes from where Lauren was last seen. A woman from his past came to the police and told them that they needed to look into him because he allegedly made comments to her like, hey, you know what happened to Lauren? That same thing could happen to you. The show 2020 arranged for James to take a lie detector test, and it was conducted by veteran polygraph examiner Ralph Neves, which he gladly agreed to. When questions about Lauren came up, he stuck to denying that he knew anything about Lauren or her disappearance, and as far as the test showed, he was telling the truth. That was the end of that theory. But as a spinoff from there, could it have been that she was walking home and there was a drunk driver on the road who hit her? and instead of calling police, decided to conceal her body? Possibly. Another one of the big theories was that Lauren was involved with a very prominent and very dangerous biker gang in Bloomington. This gang is called the Sons of Silence. So a tip came in that there was a possible link between Lauren and a former member named Robert Strange. Apparently, while Robert was in this gang, he was the one that everyone came to when they had problems, and he was the one to take care of it. He had no criminal history, but police knew of him. The tip claimed that Robert had shot Lauren in a dispute over drugs and then buried her in his yard. When Robert was questioned about this, he became very angry and said, No, I didn't shoot her. I had nothing to do with it. I don't even know the broad. I told you that. There isn't anybody here and I haven't ever seen her. Never been around her. Nothing. Based on Lauren's cell phone records, it's highly unlikely she had any suspicious connections like Robert, especially in Indianapolis. Robert more than likely had many people who disliked him and then possibly linked him to Lauren's case as payback. Now, this next one kind of ties into the first one, but came from one specific person. A man named Corey Hammersley, who was an inmate at the Indiana State Prison, used to be a star athlete and partier at Indiana University at the same time that Lauren attended school there. One day when a photo of Lauren came up on the TV, Corey apparently told a fellow inmate, man, I knew the guys that did that. Corey claimed that Lauren had died at a house party after drinking heavily and taking ecstasy with a group of unidentified students. He said that her overdose scared them, so they threw her body in the Ohio River to get rid of any evidence. When he was asked if he was involved, he said absolutely not. 
when asked to contact police with any useful information, he said that he probably wouldn't do that and that he didn't want to be involved with the case at all. Now, the very last theory is that Lauren was kidnapped and murdered because, strangely enough, her case was not the first suspicious disappearance of a young woman in Bloomington. In 2009, 29-year-old Crystal Grubb disappeared just for her body to be found one month later in a cornfield. Her death is still unsolved to this day. In 2015, four years after Lauren's disappearance, 22-year-old Hannah Wilson, who was also a student at the university, also went missing. Interestingly enough, Hannah had also been at Kilroy's bar, and the last anyone had seen of her, she was walking by herself after a night of heavy drinking. Her body ultimately was found on an isolated stretch of land. She had been bludgeoned to death. Luckily, a cell phone was at her feet, and it belonged to 50-year-old Daniel Messel. Daniel was single, an employee of a local print shop, living with his father in a trailer in rural Monroe County. When police arrived at his trailer, they found him carrying a bag of men's clothing that was covered in blood. They also found blood in his Kia Sportage. He was ultimately found guilty. Talking new theory in the Lauren Spearer case, the Brown County prosecutor tells the Bloomington Herald Times he suspects the man convicted of killing IU student Hannah Wilson is also connected to the disappearance of Lauren Spearer. Wilson was killed in November of 2015. Daniel Messel was found guilty of murder in the case. Spear, also an IU student, was last seen in 2011 and is believed to be dead. So could these deaths have all been connected? Or are there just multiple murderous people walking the streets of Bloomington? The biggest similarity between Hannah and Lauren was the fact that they were around the same age. They both were Indiana University students, both had been drinking the night they went missing, and had been at Kilroy's bar. As of 2023, Lauren's body has never been found. Police have searched land, landfills, lakes, rivers, but no luck. The case has received more than 800 tips and has executed 10 search warrants over the years. Lauren's mother took to Facebook on what would have been Lauren's 32nd birthday just this past January. And in a post, she said, I always dread certain days, days of significance, days that remind me of your absence, days that underscore the loss. Today is one of those days, your birthday, dear Lauren. I cannot fathom what fate took you from us. I know time is finite. Your time was unjustly so. Birthdays are meant to be celebratory, happy, and reflective. I honestly try to be happy on this day. The day you were born was one of the happiest days of our lives. Your dad, Rebecca, and I all approach this day in our own way. For me, I am filled with debilitating sadness. This day for me is overshadowed by those responsible for your absence. They walk hand in hand with you, reminders of how fragile life can be. How in an incredible instant a life can be taken with, without conscience or recourse. You are always in my thoughts and in my heart. Maybe next year will be different. Maybe next year justice will walk hand in hand with you in a place of evil. I celebrate you today, Lauren, as best as I can. Know that Dad, Rebecca, and I love you more than words can say. You are missed. All my love always, Mom. I know this case was a lot, guys, because there are so many different names, places, and theories, but I do want to know what you think because I'm honestly a bit torn here. Do you lean more toward this being a random crime, or do you think that her social circle knows more than they are leading everyone to believe? Let me know what you think in the comments below, but even more than that, please, guys, do me a favor. It's a free favor. All you have to do, it will help Lauren's family. Just take a quick second. The share button you see below this video. Copy the link and share this video on Facebook, on social media, in your group chat with your friends, to friends, to family, on your own channel, on your community tab, wherever you can. Because like I said, Lauren's body still has not been found to this day. Her family desperately is looking for answers, for closure, for anything. And we all say that the more times we can raise awareness and make someone's case be heard, the more likely a tip will be generated. Somebody will remember hearing something, seeing something, knowing something. And it doesn't matter that it's been several years. Tips come in all the time. Crimes are solved decades later. So please just take a quick second and share this link anywhere you possibly can so that hopefully a lead is generated and, and Lauren's family can get some answers and hopefully ultimately get some closure as well. I would appreciate it so much if you would do that. I know her family would as well. So please 
Leave your comments below after you share the link with what you think happened to Lauren, who you think's responsible, and of course, please also leave your supportive comments for Lauren's family. All right, guys, thank you so much for tuning in today, and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.